one American airplane factory, one of many. One bomber. This Martin B-26 Marauder is on display at its final duty station in Ohio. It's a medium bomber that flew in World War II. This aircraft was restored and is on display at the MAPS Air Museum near the Akron Canton Airport. Only six of the planes still exist today. 30 years ago, the B-26 Historical Society videotaped the Marauder's air and ground crews. I was on the first mission on invasion morning. While the audio and video quality isn't in high definition like today, the Historical Society's foresight preserves a rich archive of stories of what these men went through during World War II. I heard somebody say, well, he was a nice guy, sorry to have lost him. We hear the Marauder men, in their own words, speak about their trusted machine of war. The B-26, and it was the plane of tomorrow. The B-26 became one of the best bombers of World War II. It had, per mission and per capita, one of the lowest loss rates of any bomber in World War II, at least for the American Air Force, which led to the crews being very dedicated to the Martin B-26 Marauder. Um, they felt the aircraft was a great aircraft. It got them home. Um, they would sometimes fly two missions a day. Um, so they, you know, it was a rugged aircraft and the crews really, really loved it. And they also have a very strong connection and camaraderie with each other. They refer to themselves as Marauder men or where the wasps are concerned, Marauder women. They were always kind of left out a little bit. You know, here they were doing all these missions and doing these great strike, you know, doing these really important missions supporting American and allied troops on the ground. But the Army Air Force was all about its strategic campaign, so the 8th Air Force was always getting all the news. Um, and also the B-26, compared to its brother medium bomber, the B-25, didn't have a really famous mission like the Doolittle Raid that everyone kind of thinks about when you see a B-25, which is really kind of unfair to the aircraft and to the men and women who flew, serviced, maintained, and built the aircraft. A good airplane, and I'm here to tell you today that the B-26 was a plane of yesterday, it was a plane of day, and if you've ever watched Discovery Channel and see how many planes <clears throat> have been developed off of the basic design of the B-26, and it was the plane of tomorrow. The Martin B-26 Marauder is probably one of the most important World War II aircraft you have never heard of. It was in production for three years, and only 5,288 were ever made. So the B-26 was a rather advanced bomber of its time. It had flush rivets, it had powered turrets, um, and hit, used a relatively new electric Curtis prop. Um, so there was some issues early on with the aircraft, one of them being that the prop was kind of finicky, and there was times it would go into reverse pitch or out of pitch on takeoff, which would pretty much mean disaster. Um, losing an engine on takeoff in a hot aircraft like a B-26 was catastrophic. Uh, it was also a hot aircraft. It had what was called a uh, high wing loading, which meant it had a, a very high landing and takeoff speed and what they call a high stall speed. Um, mostly because it had short wings and a short tail so that it could be fast and sleek, but that also meant that there was issues with control and also just the fact that it was easy to stall. It was so problematic that it ended up with several derogatory nicknames. Most of the B-26 units that were going overseas were training at MacDill Air Force Base near Tampa, so there was always the comment about one a day in Tampa Bay because they were often losing them in training incidents. Several things kind of fixed this over time. Um, pilot training was a big one. 
They trained pilots better in transition school. They made sure that they had time on twin-engine training aircraft instead of just going from single-engine trainers into the B-26. Some of the aircraft had some of the similar uh, flight characteristics that the B-26 had. Another thing was training mechanics better to deal with some of the issues and flight engineers to deal with some of the issues. Um, on top of that, the later versions had longer wings and a taller tail. One of the big things to kind of get people, the pilots in particular, to feel comfortable about flying the B-26 was when Squee Burnett and Jimmy Doolittle went around America and then various uh, bases overseas flying B-26s, showing that the B-26 could be flown on one engine, that you weren't gonna crash if you knew what you were doing. And Squee Burnett would go around these airfields flying on one engine turning the airplane into the engine that was out, which is like the textbook thing you're not supposed to do with any aircraft, let alone the B-26, and was showing people that it was doable and that the aircraft was not as problematic as people were saying. The B-26 featured at the Maps Air Museum never flew in combat. It crashed in 1942 while flying from California to its first wartime base in the Alaskan Aleutian Islands. It was one of three B-26s that were forced down in the Yukon Territory of Canada. We took off. We went by way of Portland and or from Portland over to Spokane. And then we were going to go up the Inland Route, which, as you know, is the roughly the route of the Alcan Highway now. Uh, by Edmonton, White Horse, on into Fairbanks, and then uh, Elmendorf Field at Anchorage, Alaska. We ran into darkness because we had lost some time in takeoff. We ran into snow, sleet, and we were getting low on gas. After searching around, trying to find where we were, we soon, it soon became evident that we were extremely lost. And with the bad weather, it was decided by the pilots of the flight to crash land the three ships in a high shallow valley, roughly about 5,000 feet above sea level, in the foothills of the Canadian Rockies. We hit the snow and crashed. Now, you say, well, why is it that you got lost? But you see, when the war came along, all of their ranges, all of their radio aids, all navigational ages were immediately shut off. Because at that time, no one knew whether or not they might be coming in and bombing Canada or the western part of the United States. So we were flying without any navigational aids whatsoever, the best way to do, by the seat of our pants. These three planes going down in this valley, which later on became to be known as Million Dollar Valley. The lack of maps was the cause of that, basically. Also, we were young and inexperienced pilots from the standpoint of flying in the mountains. It was the early part of the war, and some parts of the airplanes were needed to repair others. Later on in the April of 1942, the Air Force sent in a ground crew to reclaim some of the parts off of these crash planes. And the parts we received uh, from that uh, reclamation project uh, turned out to be really our air depot and supply depot for our Aleutian campaign, which is soon to come up. The three marauders were brought out of their crash site in 1971 by a World War II airplane restorer, David Talashe. The parts for the MAPS B-26 arrived in 1994. Well, I actually got involved with the B-26 right uh, when we got it. Uh, I was on the board of directors in 1994. Talashe called us during the meeting and wanted to know whether we were interested in taking on the Marauder project. Uh, you didn't have to think about that very long <laughs> and said yes. David Talashe was actually one of our early sponsor. David was well known for farming projects from the aircraft that he'd recovered worldwide to different organizations um, basically all over the country. And what had happened with the B-26, David had, that was one of the three that 
uh, his organization recovered from northern British Columbia in 1971. And they, they helicoptered them out and then loaded them on a train and took them down to Chino, California. Ours and the other one, which is now at the Pima Air Museum, were used to supply parts to restore the one aircraft that he put back in flying condition. And that particular aircraft is owned by Kermit Weeks at Fantasy of Flight down in Polk City, Florida. After that, David sent our B-26 to uh, Air Heritage in Beaver Falls, PA. And over time, he became dissatisfied with the progress that they were making. And uh, so he shipped it to an organization at Cuyahoga County Airport. And at some point, they lost their building, so he didn't have a home for it. And since we're nearby, and it's a relatively easy trip, uh, that's how we ended up with the Marauder. Since it is only one of six in existence, it was brought back to display condition rather than rebuilding it to fly. We had to take a few liberties with it and mostly for cost and time constraints, but uh, I think on the outside it, it looks fairly, fairly accurate representation. I would call it restored. She's restored to static display condition. Our original intent was actually to restore it to flying condition. And a lot of the work that was done early on, uh, the parts that were manufactured for it were heat treated to the proper strength so that they would meet uh, airworthiness. But over time, it kind of be, it became apparent that probably wasn't the best idea to restore it to flying condition given the rarity of the aircraft. Over 90 people helped rebuild this aircraft housed at the museum. Uh, we didn't have a lot of the skills early on uh, so we, for, for restoring airplanes, so we had to figure all that out as we went. Uh, we have microfilms of all the original drawings for the airplane, so that's kind of how we uh, could make parts up for it, for ribs, and. Uh, all the things that were either damaged or missing. So it wound up taking about 21 years to where we are today, where it's nearly complete as a static display. Uh, a lot of people have touched it along the years, a lot of outside companies that have done things either cheap or for free or donated. So I'm very grateful to everyone that's helped out on it and turned it into what it is today. We had one of the guys from Goodyear uh, teach us how to do riveting, how to properly extract rivets and, you know, working with the equipment to, uh, you know, properly rivet metal together and what we needed to look for and kind of a uh, de facto training uh, academy, if you will. Uh, we had to look at what we were going to do to get the aircraft together structurally as far as putting engines on it, you know, working towards that goal and getting the landing gear cleaned up, and uh, there was a lot of study that was involved. We actually went with uh, modern day uh, aviation repair manuals and the, you know, how to do the metal work and how to do the skinning and all that other stuff. There was a lot of uh, research on how the aircraft were put together as best we could. This was pre-internet days, so we just had to go by whatever books we could get a, our hands on or whatever experience other people had with the actual aircrafts. It requires a lot of different talents. I mean, we have, well, Dave, who is the crew chief, is an engineer to make work on the parts. I know that he used uh, CAD CAM to actually design the templates for some of the parts that we made. Everybody brought different talents to the, to the project. And those of us who are not aviation mechanics, we learn by doing, learning by people from people who uh, knew what they were doing and were willing to teach us. It's such a big project that it's something that one person just can't do by themselves. It, it just it takes a team, and I think that's what makes it fun is you get everybody together and working towards a common goal.
And one of the things that was really fun that Dave did was um, he applied his engineering talents to making a jig stand for the wings so he could do all the repairs that were necessary to the structure on the wings and the engine nacelles. Now this jig he designed not only was a framework to support the wing, but it allowed the wing to be rotated about its long axis so you could actually get to different areas as you needed to work on it. And that's just, that was just fascinating. Initially, we only worked uh, Wednesdays, Wednesday evenings and Saturday mornings. So we get people in and the time was limited. A lot of us were still working full time. So it's just, uh, it's the reality of the thing. And just what I found fun was just to see it come together. You see a little, you build the pieces, you begin to put it together. Well, a lot of hands have touched it over the years, and I, I certainly couldn't have done any of this on my own. I just do my part of it, but I always give uh, credit to the crew, and we're a team, and everybody has input on it. Um, yeah, I just it's just a great group of people, and I think we live in a, a nice area here where people have a lot of skills to offer, and it just always seems like the right person or the right thing comes in at the right time, I've really been blessed, and MAPS has been blessed. So we're very grateful. The restoration crew members grew to have a heightened respect for what the World War II crews went through. You start to think about having read a lot of books about uh, air crew experiences and then actually talking to the guys that flew in these aircraft when you're up there. You know, it's, it's an empty fuselage full of bits and pieces, but when you're crawling around inside of it, you just get a sense of uh, the guys that were there actually working in these aircraft and what they must have seen and what they must have experienced. Along with a new respect for the World War II flyers came a growing desire to learn the history of the planes as they were used in the different theaters of operation. Well, just the history of the aircraft, the Marauder is such a rare airplane and to a degree underrepresented in, uh, in the history of World War II. I mean, it was, it was, there were something over 5,000 of them made. And although it suffered through all kinds of problems in training pilots because it was a much hotter aircraft than what a lot of people were used to, it achieved the lowest loss rate in combat of any American aircraft. And then after the war, most of the ones that were in Europe were dynamited on site, on the field in Europe. I think it's just an underappreciated aircraft, which is why it feels such a, a great affection for it. The restoration team members experienced not only the satisfaction of a job well done, but it gave them a sense of what the original ground and air crews saw and did. It amazed me as I crawled around inside these old airplanes that, you know, 50 years earlier, at that time anyways, uh, you know, there were guys in full flight suits and parachutes, and I don't know how they did it myself, to be honest with you. I find it a tight space, and I'm just in jeans and a t-shirt. There was a, a big flak burst right underneath the uh, starboard engine, and a big chunk of flak came through the... Uh, the plexiglass nose. The thing that saved my life was the uh, my ammunition belt that I had looped into the gun. It exploded the, one of the bullets. I still have the bullet and piece of flak. I got hit about the face and uh, some glass in my eyes. And I, naturally, I jumped back. I was flying as a tall galeer at the time. I jumped back. I lost my hand mic that went under my leg someplace, and I still had my eye on that lead plane to to drop on it. And I could hear the pilot calling me and the smoke drifting back through the, through the tunnel there over the co-pilot's uh, legs. And I could hear them trying to contact me. And I heard somebody say, well, he was a nice guy. Sorry to have lost him. And uh, about that time, I dropped. The lead man dropped. I dropped on him. And I scooted out of that, <laughs> that nose as fast as I could get. And if you remember anything about the B-26, the co-pilot had to, had to lift up his latch there and slide his is the seat back so that the bombardier or navigator or whoever was up front could get out. I didn't even need that. I went past him like a scared rabbit and 
and I didn't stop till I hit the bomb bay doors. He, he couldn't believe that I got past them uh, uh, when I did. Now, we landed, and they were sending the ambulance up to take me down to the uh, uh, dispensary to patch me up a little bit. And while I was waiting, I, I think I counted about 29 holes in the aircraft. And uh, I went down, and I went to the dispensary, and they cleaned me up and cleaned out my eyes and cauterized my wounds. And uh, as I leave, as I'm leaving the uh, dispensary, I, I somebody comes along and hey, Levy, we're looking for you. We're looking for you. We got to fly an a the mission this afternoon. And I said, I can't. I haven't been to briefing. I don't know where we're going. He says, Don't worry about it. We're going back to the same place. I remember one point, uh, Dave, the uh, the uh, our leader of the pack, said we were getting the pilot seat for the bomber. And he had been with, uh, in, in contact with somebody, I think it was North Carolina or South Carolina. It was kind of a curio shop, from what I understand. And they somehow had the pilot seat for a B-26 bomber. So we gathered, we, we uh, round up some money, all the guys. And uh, he drove down there with his uh, pickup truck and brought back the pilot seat. It was beautiful. It was worn just enough to be right. The upholstery was right. So he checked it all out and everything was, was there. So he said, well, let's take it over and put it in the plane. And in the cockpit floor, there's a set of rails. And we picked up the seat, lifted it up, and set it down and went right in the tracks. Just perfect in a slid as it should. So we got it adjusted and tightened it up. And Dave said, do you mind if I sit in it first? I said, no. So I got in the co-pilot seat. We had the, had the side windows open. We're looking out the window, hanging out like a couple kids. And uh, Dave sits there in the seat. And I'm just watching him. His hands go right over to the throttle. Automatically, right to the throttle. And he's sitting there, and I'm, I'm watching him. And I was like watching a movie of like invasion of, uh, of Normandy. Like he was sitting there looking out through the windshield and just watching the cliffs come up and everything. And uh, it was amazing. It was very, um, very emotional. So uh, he's sitting there, he, said, he looked over and he says, you want to sit? I said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I got in the seat and the same movie played for me. I was on the first, mission on Invasion Morning, and uh, that was one of the things that I look back and I say, it was the, probably the greatest sight a person will ever see. All of the ships and all of the airplanes and all of the men, uh, we had a very definite pattern. If you took off, you had to go at a certain altitude, which was really low level, so that all the other planes taking off from all of the other bases at the same time, you wouldn't collide. And our mission at that invasion morning was at 1,500 feet, clearing the beaches along there, shooting, just shooting at random to keep the Germans heads down so the men could make those beaches. And we could watch them look over the side, and we could see them getting out of their landing craft and hitting the beaches and uh, made that pass. And, of course, you could see where the uh, parachuters had been the night before and landed. It seems to be one of the favorites among the 55 aircraft on display or under restoration at the MAPS Museum. You know, I like to honor uh, the people that designed it, built it, of course flew it, maintained it, and uh, just for their efforts on it. I don't think that could ever be duplicated again. So that that's what's in it for me. I, you know, I like paying tribute to all those people and the sacrifices they all made. Uh, Boyer was, was great for unusual 
uh, training techniques. Uh, he was the first one, or he was the only one for that matter, who showed me and several other of my friends how to barrel roll a B-26, which was strictly forbidden. I had a number of firsts. Uh, I, to my knowledge, was the first man to be on a, a B-26 that uh, spun in. Uh, Jack Beal was the pilot, Al Graves was the co-pilot, and we spun in because we had the type that did not have those uh, boots, or ice, de-icing boots on the wing, and we built up, because of uh, ice build up on the wings, as I understand it, uh, we hit a high-speed stall and spun in and we crash-landed in the mountain. Now, i would read a lot about aircraft and bombers and B-26s, but being a bombardier, I wasn't real sure uh, about the mechanics of flying, but I was, had never read up to that point of a B-26 coming out of a spin. And naturally, during that spin, you don't have all that amount of time to do a lot of research. But uh, it was, uh, there is one thing that it was attributed to me after we crash landed and got out of the um, plane was that, uh, that I stuck my knife in the ground and claimed that land for Texas. That's not true. I stuck the radio antenna in the ground and claimed that land for Texas. 